Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 271, featuring the first in a new uh, interview series with Miss Susan Manley, the chief operating officer and executive producer at Old School, uh, the company that just uh, uh, brought out battle chess, dog football, <laughs> and much, much more. It's uh, Rebecca Heinemann's uh, company. Now, before uh, starting there, uh, Susan worked at uh, SSI, uh, the company responsible for the Gold Box games, as well as Electronic Arts, overseeing some really exciting stuff, including Bard's Tale 4, uh, which we get into in this interview. Uh, we also talk in this interview about uh, how Susan got her start in the video games industry, namely by working at one of the first ever uh, computer game stores in, in America. Uh, and we also talk about the other stuff going on at, uh, at Old School. Anyway, a lot of stuff to cover. So without further ado, here is Miss Susan Manley. All right, folks, I am here with the great Susan Manley. She's the COO and executive producer of Old School. Uh, formerly, she was the lead artist and project manager of the art department at SSI, a company you're probably very familiar with if you watch this show. And she was also the first ever uh, project manager for internally developed projects at a little company named Electronic Arts. <laughs> <laughs> How are you uh, today, Susan? I am good. I think that I was employee number 236, so we weren't too small right about then. <laughs> oh. Well, let's uh, talk about a little bit about uh, old school uh, to start off with. I noticed you know, as you're the COO and C CEO is uh, our own uh, Rebecca Heineman, right? Yeah. So how did you and uh, Becky meet? We met at a party. Um, I had been talking to R.J. Michael for some time through Facebook, and I hadn't met him in person, and he invited me over to a party. And so I grabbed a friend of mine, Maureen Starkey, whom we, we met at SSI years and years ago, and we went over to R.J.'s party. And uh, I was not having that great of a time. Um, there were not that many people there that were out and entrepreneurial in the games business. There were just a lot of Sony people. And so I was a little bit bored and I was teasing RJ, well, where are all the girls? There's just all these young game geeks. And all of a sudden Rebecca walked in with one of her friends. And so I went and I greeted her at the front door and I must've intimidated her because the first thing that she did was show me a picture of her girlfriend. <laughs> 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 but uh, we ended up sitting down on the couch and talking probably nonstop for the next three hours. Um, I had never met Rebecca before in the industry, and we had a lot in common, which was really funny. Um, I actually worked on Bard's Tale 4. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. I was, I was the project manager. I was the person that brought in Victor Penman, who finally had killed it, <laughs> which that's a story in its own. But, uh, yeah, Rebecca and I had a lot of industry uh, things to share, and it was pretty fun. I also was lucky enough to have another friend of mine. Um, well, I had Maureen there, who got to meet Rebecca at the same time. And I also had uh, Chuck, um, what is Chuck Slide? Somerville there as well. And so we were all chatting in a circle. It was pretty fun. We had to come back to this Mars Tell Force story. <laughs> So uh, we talked a little bit with Becky last time about the battle chess uh -huh. game. Has there been any any updates on how the, on that game, how it's doing? Um, battle chess has been released for early access on Steam. We haven't quite finished it yet. We're on on other things at the moment. Um, we intend to come back to it, but I can't tell you exactly when. Um, the thing that's not there right now in its complete form is the tournament system. So you can play battle chess, you can keep your scores, but you just can't tournament. Did you have anything to do with the animations on that and the No, the no. Artwork? No. No, unfortunately I haven't I that was one of the few games actually that I didn't do artwork for. Um, Janelle uh, did a bunch of the advertisement artwork that were used for the game and a bunch Janelle, of the iconic Janelle Janelle Jakeways. That would be Janelle Jakeways, yeah. that's right. Yeah. But uh, no, that's one of the few games that I didn't actually do artwork. Instead, I actually got to do the test matrix for the game. 
<laughs> and I haven't done one of those in a long, long time. <laughs> uh, what about dog football? Dog football. We just recently started that project with Dan Mueller of Judah Baby, and it's a fun little project. We're enjoying it quite a bit. Yeah, I wasn't even aware of the of dog dog football as a sport until you know just a couple weeks ago. It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, you know, um, I wasn't aware of it either until I really met Dan. I, I had heard about it very briefly from Rebecca, actually at, right after RJ's party, because that's where they met as well. But uh, it, I hadn't known, like, the full story on dog football. Apparently, it was designed by somebody that I worked with at Electronic Arts, um, Dave Ralston, which I thought that was really funny. You know, it always circles back. It's a small back world, isn't it? It's a really small world. And of course, Dave, Dave was a huge fan of Madden football. So it's funny. I was talking to my team the other day and uh, our, my own tester, John, John Turp and uh, Trevor were both saying, this plays a lot like Madden. And I started laughing and I said, well, it could have a lot to do that Dave was probably heavily influenced by the way that Madden played. They used to play, he and John Solowitz used to play that all the time in their cube on their breaks. Dog football? No, John Madden. Oh, mad John Madden. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I think I'd rather play the dog football than the, the Madden myself. Yeah, my, you know what? Me too. <laughs> it's, and it's not that I don't like Madden. Madden's fun, but sure. uh, it's like kind of a known quantity. I want to go see what all the wild stuff that can happen in dog football is. I noticed you also brought in, uh, looks like your first male employee, uh, Trevor Snowden, at least on the website. Yes, yes. Well, how long has he been, been on board? Uh, we first started talking to Trevor back in March of this year. Um, he approached us, and at the time we were going, gosh, uh, we're doing uh, battle chess. Uh, we don't have anything else to do right now. Um, we like you. I, and so Rebecca and I started talking um, constantly about what we wanted to do next set of products and realized that we had a couple of things that we really wanted to do and and how Trevor could fit in so I called him up and had a pep talk with him and he got totally excited and said yes count me in and he's been actively doing stuff for us since about May he's got to feel pretty interesting to be in the, the minority <laughs> he's a minority guy <laughs> at a game studio that might be a first in the industry. I don't know. You know what? That's actually entirely possible. We did write him a little press release, and we mentioned the fact that he's he's the junior child in our group <laughs> with only 21 years of experience. <laughs> only 21 years. <laughs> only 21 years. Oh. Trevor's a blast. He's really fun. And he and I get on the phone, and we can't stop talking. Okay, well, before anybody uh, tries to kill me, we better find out about Bard's Tale 4. So what was the... So you were part of the development team on that, the design team? I was the project manager for the product. But, of course, with my art background, I could look heavily at what they were doing. With Bard's Tale 4, they were trying to take three different game engines and meld them together. So you had basically a forward uh, dungeon crawl scrolling hallway engine. And then... Um, Chris Earhart, by the way, was the producer at the time of the, on this product. He wanted it, when you went into combat, to switch into this mode where it went to, to a sideways viewpoint and you could duke it out so you could fire arrows or, you know, fight with a sword. And that was an entirely different game engine that needed to load and look like, you know, similar artwork and all sorts of other things. And then there was going to be a top-down stra strategic view of the map, so where you were adventuring to and the game would scroll up and you would see where you were and so nobody had really done that yet um, there had been some minor stuff that you know alluded to that with the little windowed products like what we did at SSI where you scrolled through a hallway and then it loaded pictures mm -hmm. but nobody had done like three swapping applications and so it was pretty intense from a from a technical point of view, but it was also what they had not realized. They had a they had an assistant producer doing most of the design, and unfortunately, since he really hadn't done it before, he didn't realize that he needed to have transitional art between the different viewpoints so that things melded, so you weren't walking through this ivy-covered hallway and then you were all of a sudden in a stone dungeon. <laughs> 
And when I pointed this out that he needed to have transitional art, of course, when you do that kind of stuff, all of a sudden the art budgets double what it was. And that means a lot more time. It means a lot more overhead to carry around. It needs a lot more loading in the, to the product. It was an intense nightmare. And so they never did quite figure it all out um, as they got further into it. That was, by the way, the first internally developed project at Electronic Arts that hit $1 million. Wow. We burned $1 million before we killed the product. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and Which was a lot of money in development in those days. They didn't spend that kind of dollar. Um, the Somewhere about, oh, I don't know, five or six months into it, um, we were having a high level meeting with management and I said, you know, there's only one person that I know that really could sit down and logistically figure this out. And, you know, if, if there's a product that can come out of it would figure it out. And that would be Victor Penman whom I'd worked with at SSI and Victor had project managed and process managed the art and the design together over at SSI and so they called him up and and soon enough Victor was up there working with the rest of us and he both thanks me and hates me for it I think because <laughs> Bard's Tale was hard I mean you're working on one of the one of the highest end properties of, of the company at the time and trying to figure it out based on what had been said already and you know out there and of course he was carrying the legacy budget of all of that had gone before I wonder what happened to all those assets for that game. You know, I couldn't tell you for sure. I know that about oh, seven or eight years ago when I was cleaning out my house, I threw away a couple boxes of, deep, of discs. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I actually even did some art for that game, for that matter. Um, I did an animating horse and uh, oh, some other... horseback riding. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, I I didn't like what they had done, and and I went in and fixed the horse character that they had created. Um, unfortunately, at, in art, many times it's much easier to sh to show than it is to explain, <laughs> especially in subtle things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, Susan, you I guess have been interested or been involved with computers even from your very earliest childhood, right? As you're telling me about how your dad worked at worked on the Univac and the Burroughs, uh, doing guidance guidance systems uh, for missiles. Is that? My yeah. father was a rocket scientist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must My... have been the source of endless jokes. So. <laughs> well, actually, yes. Um, we. Uh... My earliest computing experiences were coloring the printouts that he used to bring home at Christmas time or Thanksgiving. You know, the the giant X's and O's images, and we would have crayons and color them out. And they brought home the punch cards, and we made wreaths out of them. This was a big thing to do in the 60s and the early 70s. It recycled everything. Um, and that's pretty much all that I knew about computers at the time, although at one point my father did take us on a tour at UNIVAC, and we actually got to walk in the computer room. I, the biggest thing that I remember is how big all of the reels were and how cold it was in there. It was really cold because they had the air conditioner way up. Yeah, those machines. The Univac, how, how big of a computer was that? You know, I don't know. Is that one of the I ones the size of a fridge or the size of a truck? It was actually spread all the way around the outside perimeter of a, like, 30 by 30 room. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, it we was... We probably have more computing power in our iPhones. It, or... <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah, apparently. Apparently so. <laughs> and you were also telling me how your brother, I guess he was kind of a computer guy too, right? Took you to San Jose State San Jose State to play some Hunt the Wumpus and Star he Trek. Was... What's this game called Rats? You have to tell me about that. <laughs> okay. Um, the... Uh... San Jose State computer. My older brother was a physics major down at San Jose State, but he also had some computing classes. And when he was going down to do his labs at night, um, he would get lonely. So he asked me to go along with him. And I was like, what am I going to do? And he's like, I'll put you on the, the computer to play. And of course, 
my only thoughts of what a computer were at that time were based on whatever science fiction I'd read. <laughs> I had no clue what I was in for. And the computer, when we first started playing with it, they didn't have monitors. If you did something, you had to print it out. So I was playing Star Trek, the game, which was written by college students, apparently. And uh, we were printing out the moves, and you're moving through the star field, and everything's done with ASCII characters and stars or, or little asterisks. And the ship was a V, and oh, wow, you know. <laughs> it was bizarre. Um, and everything was going on inside your head. Um, and that was my first introduction to computer games. Uh, eventually, they got monitors, and we could actually see what was going on as we moved things around. And uh, Rats was a game where you had a, um, a multi-story building, and you had rat poison. You had slow rat poison and fast rat poison. And you had to go place it out in the building and try and kill off all of the rats before they repopulated, you know, or reproduced. And it was just a bizarre lemonade game <laughs> of conserving and using resources to try and maximize the effort. And I, it was a very strange game. <laughs> like it's one of, well overdue for a Kickstarter reboot, huh? <laughs> I'm just thinking these printing terminals, you know, people, you know, they talk now about frames per second. I guess back then it was lines, <laughs> lines per minute or something. Right. Well, and, and how many text lines could you pop up and then have decision-making points and how many different types of decisions could you make? Yes, no, and what else? Um, At this point, were you already thinking about, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to do uh, games. Actually, um, I started to get into that more and more as I hung out with different people that played other types of games. Um, when I was 19, I got into uh, AD and, or actually when I was 17, I got into AD and D, the paper game. Um, we, we were playing second edition late at night. I was dating the guy that was the dungeon master and he dragged me to a game. And I had never, I had no idea what, to expect at all i had never been to a game like that and the guys held it out in their garage and since i was the first female ever to attend their game ooh, <laughs> they all wore costumes they had dry ice and they flooded the garage with the dry ice we couldn't breathe we had opened the door <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they had I, candles that didn't running. go over as well as they hoped i guess well, they made a big impression i mean i stayed and played um probably for the next year and a half that was a lot of fun. What was your character? Uh, I actually had two. They had me roll up two, apparently, you know, just in case one gets killed. <laughs> I had a, a lawful good dwarven fighter, and I had a half-elf bard. Female characters? or? Yep, yeah. both female. The, the, the dwarf and I ended up adventuring almost all the way through the next two, almost two years. Her name was Bartimir. Bartimir. <laughs> Bartimir. So did this this is what led you to be uh, interested in designing games for a living or working in the games um, industry? Actually, no, that didn't really do it. Um, I was thinking that I wanted to be an artist mm -hmm. um, working on the LucasArts films or the at Lucasfilm. I wanted to do the computer graphics there. For the movies so or for the games? For, for the movies. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, that was when uh, Star Wars was really popular and, uh, you know, they were doing the high end, really cool stuff. And that's what I really wanted to get into. However, um, I got sucked into managing a computer game store in San Jose, California. Um, some friends of mine had bought the Commodore computer centers from Commodore directly. There was one in San Jose and one in Santa Clara. And they decided to open up a, a store that was purely just games. And they invited me to come be the manager of it. And, well, that was a pretty cool idea. And I hadn't really used a home computer much. I had used um, a computer down at uh, Happy Hollow Park and Zoo where I had worked to do, like, the books. But I had never used home computers very much except for to play one computer game i played uh, wizard and princess when i was about 19 oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which that's an old sierra online game yeah. for folks that don't know anyhow um so well, with all the rocks in it i 
snake. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you're trying to fit it's the guess the word games. That's what I used to call the original Sierra games. You had to figure out what was the operative word that was going to make it do something. And uh, that and you had to have good spelling. <laughs> but uh, the uh, getting into the game store was what really got me into the games world um, because I was interacting with all of these folks that made games, first off, but then I was also uh, looking very critically at the games and what was be able to be done inside of games. And if I, we also, we had all of the different gaming systems there. So we had the ones that had voice commands and all sorts of other stuff going on. Um, it was a B-52 bomber, the Intellivision game that had the voice stuff. Uh, we uh, also supported some of the other older systems that were not as common, the Astrocade, the Odyssey. Um, so I, you know, all of these different machines that played entirely different style of products, it was pretty interesting. And then we also had um, the small computers of the time. So we had the VIC-20 and later the C64. We had the Atari 400, the 800, eventually the 1200. And so... Do you have All a favorite out? Do you have a favorite platform or favorite computer? That I liked the C sixty four quite a bit, and the reason I liked it was it was instant boot up. Um, it was pretty easy to understand. I could actually even program a little bit in you probably the basic. Recognize method. this, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I used to still have my pokes memorized. I used to oh, amaze wow. the guys that. The, the engineers at, at EA, I would say, no, that's poke, blah, 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 blah. They would go, oh, my God. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I should have worn my, my uh, T-shirt. I have a, one of the old T-shirts from GDC that says uh, hex and bugs and rock and roll. <laughs> now, this is the, I love the name of the store. It's Video Adventure is the name of the store, right? Yes. I unfortunately didn't get to name it. No. But, what would uh, you? You would have named it something else or? I don't know. I, I don't know. I wasn't there for that part. But uh, y- I, we got a lot of calls for people that were looking to rent movies. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. They were thinking video vi- what meant, you know, that at the, in those days. And video stores were really popular. But we were one of the first computer game stores. And we were right there in uh, the middle of West San Jose at uh, the Winchester um, and Stevens Creek boulevards there so the kind of the heart of silicon valley you know i can't tell you how much i envy you i mean that must have been just incredible being around all the i mean i happen to love commodore it's my favorite you know platform so you must have been sort of at the hub of this commodore 64 phenomenon right the, i mean you're, you're talking a little bit about the kind of people that would come to the store and yes <laughs> which i i was really intrigued by uh you said that some Atari, I guess some Atari uh, executives or somebody was, was coming in there? kind of. One, one of the vice presidents of Atari vice came Vice presidents, in. wow. I don't remember his name because I am horrible with names, sadly. But uh, he came in and talked to me for a little while and asked me some questions about what was selling and why. And um, he asked me if it would be okay to bring a bunch of his crew by. And he did. He brought in about 12 engineers one night. And I sat down with them for about an hour and had they asked me all sorts of questions about what consumers were looking for, what they asked about, um, how long things uh, stayed popular, um, what seemed to be the process that drew people in, and we talked about it all. Um, it so was what, really what did you tell them? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> well, <laughs> the consumers definitely if if they the first time that they're finding out about the product isn't from a magazine it's whatever is on the kiosks in the store and quite frankly the things that end up on the kiosks in the store have really good demonstration modes that attract people in they have interesting gameplay video they have interesting uh, story video and they go back and forth between those things the demonstration modes were really important and that was what we were seeing at the time in the coin op world too people were more likely to go drop their quarters into a game that was self-explanatory before they got to it um, not everybody read the game mags and so the, the guy that was likely to come in and drop a couple hundred bucks for his kid hadn't read the magazines he came in and asked us 
or cruised around in the store and checked out what was available. And actually, I had a lot of uh, adults that would come in and buy games and then hide them from their kids for a few weeks so they could get really good at them so that they didn't <laughs> get beat too badly. Yeah, sure nobody does that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what, these Atari, these Atari machines just didn't have the demos that attracted the customers? Um, they, some of them did, some of them didn't. Um, I think that it got expanded upon, of course, um, anything that was cartridge based, you could only have so much of your game space allotted to those kinds of things. And so they had to try and write routines that would allow the game to auto run as the attract instead of creating specialized little programs that were the attract mode. And so it was like a whole nother engineering feat inside. Um, they did a lot of re really interesting things. You said you dated Jay Stevens, uh, the director of development for HES. Well, I'm not sure what that is. What is uh, HES? Um, human Engineered Software. Human and Engineered Software. They were an early C64 primarily and VIC-20 uh, game company. I, I believe they were acquired. They were started by a gentleman by the name of Jay Balakrishnan, and they were around for, gosh, about eight, ten years. Um, I forget who bought them at this point. What kind of stuff was it? Well, uh, they had all sorts of action and arcade products that were the really early C64 things that were on tape. Um, they had, there. they were, the uh, at the time, Commodore had adopted... Uh, Oh gosh, the guy that plays Kirk in Star oh, William Trek. William Shatner. William Shatner was their spokesman. Well, HES, Human Engineered Software, HES, they had uh, Leonard Nimoy as their spokesperson. Oh, wow, cool. So I got to actually meet Leonard Nimoy at uh, the CES the next year. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, I bet. And one of my friends actually taught Leonard Nimoy how to use a computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, will hopefully be back next week, but if not, uh, the week after with a uh, part two of this interview. Don't know what things are going to be like yet with the holiday uh, season here at the old Matt K. So I'll try to try to get the next episode out as soon as possible. As always, though, thank you very much for supporting the show, um, having these interviews with people like Susan Manley, uh, just stuff you wouldn't see uh, without something like Matt Chat. Uh, out there to uh, conduct the interviews and put them up on YouTube and everything. So uh, thank you guys. You are the ones that make it possible. And uh, kind of an exciting uh, bit of news there. I just hit the $500 uh, stretch goal uh, a couple weeks ago, actually uh, last week, on uh, Patreon. So I'll be able to provide transcripts. Now, uh, it might be a little while before I start getting the transcripts up there. Still trying to work out the best, uh, the best mechanism for that. Uh, but hopefully those will be up very soon. And I'll send you some information on the Patreon site about where to get those. Uh, but they'll be free for everybody. Uh, but it's really thanks to you guys, uh, thanks to the uh, Patreon supporters for making that happen. All right, news from the Matt Cave. Uh, I'm not. It's it's kind of big news. It's kind of weird news. <laughs> but uh, you know, you, some of you that have been with Matt Chat for a while know that I was uh, got sort of inter interested in this stuff by uh, working on a movie. Uh, that was the gameplay story of the video game revolution movie through uh, Luke's Digital Pictures. We did that back in 2009. I wrote the, uh, co-wrote the script, did a bunch of the interviews for that, um, a lot of uh, editing and stuff. And uh, then it kind of, it's kind of uh, been, <laughs> you know, every now and then we'll hear something about it, but uh, we keep thinking, what is, this, is it dead? You know, and then suddenly there'll be some news and uh, that sort of thing uh, up and down. Uh, but apparently, uh, they now officially have a date for the premiere. It will be premiering January 6th on a service called Vutopia. <coughs> V-U-T-O-P-I-A. Now, this is the, the rub. I mean, that's great. But the, the, the sad part of this is, well, if you have Time Warner cable or Bright House cable, I think you'll just be able to log in with that with your cable uh, account and watch it, as far as I can tell. I don't personally have cable, uh, so I'm still trying to figure out how to watch it if you don't have cable. <laughs> Surely there's there's some way to do this, right? Um, 
But anyway, I'll try to get the details on that. We've still got a little time. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll put a link to the uh, the movie's uh, homepage if you'd like to learn more about it. I really hope there'll be some easy way for everybody to, to see it, because I know uh, you really you really will enjoy it. It's got some really cool animation and uh, interviews with people like John Romero in there. And uh, John Smedley, just a lot of... Uh, it's, it's really cool. I'm really proud of it. Uh, so hope i I got to find some way for you guys to see it. So uh, stay tuned. All right, what about that ale of the week? Ah, well, this week I've got another one, a recommendation from old uh, Reese here at the, uh, at the uh, Coburn store. Uh, this is Badger Hill Brewing Company, uh, their White India Pale Ale, which uh, by White India Pale Ale, I'm not <laughs> exactly sure what that means. I guess it's kind of like a regular India Pale Ale, but it doesn't think that it's racist. Uh, alcohol, 5.6% by volume, uh, so not very strong. Uh, brewed and bottled by Badger Hill Brewing Company out of Minnetonka, Minnesota. Uh, Badger Hill Brewing, uh, let's see, Hoppy Belgian with, ho I, <laughs> yeah, one of those days. A Hoppy Belgian wheat beer with orange zest and coriander. Best served in a pint glass. <laughs> so according to their little meter here, it should be relatively hoppy. Yeah, I guess I, that's kind of interesting. So they got hoppy at the top and malty at the bottom. Um, I'm guessing I prefer the hoppier ones because I really don't like that malt flavor. Anyway, I don't see anything else here. So uh, uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. Uh, all right, so I got some of this uh, Badger Hill India Pale Ale. Badger Hill, you know, I wonder if there's a rat ale. <laughs> Pretty cool. Maybe the, the idea of rats, doesn't, <laughs> maybe that doesn't uh, go well with the marketing. I'm smelling, not a, not a real strong aroma on this. You can definitely smell the hops in here. A little bit of that Belgian aroma that you would, you get, it actually smells pretty good. You know, you, you kind of have to get your nose up in here, but I'm a little stuffy. That probably doesn't help either. But anyway, uh, I can't really tell that much by smelling it other than it smells fine. <laughs> Let's give it a taste though. A lot of flavor in this, kind of a nutty-like flavor, very hoppy, a little bit of a, uh, what is that, maybe a little bit of a peanut flavor. Let me try, uh, let me try it again. It is, I think white IPA uh, really is kind of a way to describe this. It's, it's sort of like that combination of the uh, sort of hoppy IPA but with a bit of a Belgian mixed in there, sort of a wheat uh, wheat beer. Um, it literally tastes like they just combined uh, two different types of beer here. It's actually a quite good. It's uh, I got no complaints about it. A nice flavor. If you like, uh, I guess if you like India Pale Ales and you like wheat beers and you, <laughs> I don't want to have to, uh, you know, choose between them. Just get this uh, white India Pale Ale and you'll. I have both in the same in the same glass. So, anyway, I'm gonna go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, really nice. I would definitely drink this. Not something I would necessarily seek out uh, special or anything, but but it's definitely a very drinkable. Uh, three out of five for the Badger Hill India Pale a White India Pale Ale. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. You guys can probably tell I'm a little bit a little woozy. Been a heck of a we just wrapped up our last uh, week of school here at St. Cloud. <laughs> Those, that's always a very interesting time. Lots and lots and lots and lots of grading. Oh. Okay, uh, so the quotation. Uh, <laughs> I was looking for quotations from uh, Leonard Nimoy, uh, since Susan was talking about him. Um, and I, found, I found a really good quote from him. I really like this. Uh, so anyway, here, here it goes. The miracle is this. The more we share, the more we have. Not a great thought. See you guys next week. Your illogical approach to chess does have its advantages on occasion, Captain. I prefer to call it inspired. 
As you wish. At any rate, the game is yours. 